Okay, um, are you guys ready to learn how to build a fork using organic modeling techniques? <coughs> this is, again, every one that we do is just a little bit different. Um, this, to, to, to create this um, object, we need to use the um, bandsaw tool, which was, has been talked about in the videos, but I don't know if you guys have explored it at all. <coughs> in addition to that, it requires um, a little bit different way of working to cut and paste, so you detach something, parts of an object, and then reattach them later on in order to make it work. So, um, let me go ahead and start here, and we'll, um, again, we're going to start with the basic box this time, um, as we've done before. And this is going to be a huge fork, but that's okay. You get the idea. And we can always change proportions. We're not locked into anything. Make sure that this is long enough. So again, I'm just starting with a box here that sort of looks right. And I'm going to go ahead and build up the thickness of it a little bit. And that looks about right, okay? So I've made a little box. And this is um, really the handle of it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to knife it a few times so that I can reshape it. Because if I hit the tab key, you can see it sort of looks like a tongue depressor right now, you know, or a surfboard. Okay, so I want to begin to shape it now by using the knife tool. And by using the knife tool and adding geometry and changing the proportions, you'll begin to see how we can shape the, the handle of it a little bit, and then we'll add the prongs to it. And then when we add the prongs, that will be when we use the um, bandsaw tool. And being careful, too, to make sure that we're using um, three or four point polys and so that we don't have any um, issues. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Shift K so that I have the knife tool selected. And let's see. I'm going to go ahead and run one across here, like so. Um, another one maybe right about here. And then another one maybe right about here. Okay. So that looks pretty good. So I'll hit Shift K to deselect it. And I've added geometry to this. <coughs> now what I want to do is I'm going to add at this top end here. This is where I'm going to add the prongs. This is the... I want uh, the handle to taper in a little bit. Right now, if I hit the tab key, notice that by adding that geometry, it has changed how this metaforms a little bit. It's not as blobby. It's a little bit, a little bit more rectangular <coughs> than it was before. So what I'm going to do now is with polygons selected, and I want to make sure under mode, it's um, I have action center is the selection. I'm going to go ahead and right click and drag <coughs> around these polygons and make sure that they're all selected. And I'm going to resize this a little bit so that it tapers in just a little bit. So I'll go ahead and we'll hit H for resize. Or I can go ahead and just hit Shift H for size. And it doesn't matter where I move it now, it, it moves it in a tad. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use um, H4. No, I do want to reset. Uh, what do I want to do? I don't know what I want to do. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and stretch it. And I'm going to move it in like so. So it tapers in like this. I want to leave the thickness about the same. OK? A little bit more. And who knows whether I've done it enough, too much, or not. Turn it off. Now watch what happens. I'll deselect, and I'll hit the Tab key so we can take a look at this. And notice how it's beginning to taper a little bit, and we get the more of a sense of, actually, it should probably even be tapered more, so I get more of a, uh, a dip when I, this is, the, this is where the prongs are going to be added, and I want that in there. So let me hit Tab again, and I'm just going to select these polygons and size it again. So I'll go ahead and select these polygons. 
and hit H, and I want to just move it in a tad more to really exaggerate it. Turn off stretch, and um, again, deselect, and hit H. And you can see how it begins to taper a little bit. Um, <coughs> you really do, when you're switching from normal mode to, to meta nerves or whatever you want to call it, subpatch, um, you have to exaggerate quite a bit. Pretty much what the guy told you in the movie when he was making that sandworm, because as soon as you hit that tab key, it softens everything out quite a bit. So you can see that there isn't really much of a change here. I can come back and change it more, but you get the, the basic idea. I mean, I probably should even thin this out a little bit more, but we'll see. I'll leave it this way for, for a while. It should be okay. And if I need to change it, I need to change it. So I'm going to hit tab, return it back. <coughs> and now what I want to do is I want to be able to add prongs to here. But to do that, I only have one polygon. I need to subdivide that, don't I? Does that make sense? I need, I need to make them equidistant and everything. I need to, if I use the knife tool through here, it goes all the way through. The knife tool doesn't measure equally either. I mean, you, we're just kind of ballparking it when we do that. I can always move it up or down or change it, but um, I want them to be equal. So what I need to do, <coughs> and this is where it's a little bit unusual in this, th that you do this, is um, I'm going to go ahead and select these polygons here. Make sure they're all selected. Okay, see how they're all selected. And I'm going to cut this, and I'm going to paste it. Looks like nothing's happened. However, watch what happens when I select these again, <coughs> and I hit T for move. Notice how it's dis they're disconnected. As soon as you cut them and then paste them, it pastes them in the identical location. <coughs> However, now they're disconnected. And what we're going to do is we're going to reconnect in a little bit. So let me undo, make sure that it's moved there. And turn off move and deselect. And now what I want to do is I just want to select a couple of polygons. I'm going to select this one and the top one, like so. And now what I'm going to do under multiply is that I want to use the bandsaw tool. And a bandsaw is, sorry, down here. Bandsaw Pro under multiply. And you need the numeric requester, and you need to look at all your windows to make sure what you're doing. What we're going to do is we're going to, <coughs> at the moment, select auto. We can, as he, as he mentioned in one of these demonstrations, and I'm trying to remember which one. He was building a hand, I believe, when he used smooth shift. <coughs> or rather, um, the bandsaw tool, and he was using it for the fingers to add geometry, to try even odd. I'm just going to leave auto for a moment, and by selecting these, these polygons, I think it will go in the right direction. I'm not sure. I want to enable divide. Notice how it's already divided that once. <coughs> well, now what I want to do is I'm going to edit and I'm going to add. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click one. And I want this to be uniform. Two, three. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. There we go. Let's make it uniform. Notice how it subdivided all those. And the, how I'm, a, I'm adding these, the number I'm determining is that I want four prongs. So here's one, one, two, three, four, every other one. Does that make sense? And notice because I have disconnected these, it's only dividing along here. And by enabling it to divide uniformly and by selecting the polygons that I did, it, it knows what direction to go. But if, it, if you don't, if, if it doesn't, by selecting auto, then go to even odd, and then it will either go one way or another. And it is like the knife tool in that it does cut all the way through. It has to go all the way through uniformly. It can't cut part way through. That's why I had to cut this apart. Now I'm ready to, um, to deselect and to go ahead and to build the prongs from here. So I'm going to use textured wired so I can see what I'm doing here. 
<coughs> and I'm going to hold down the shift key to select every other one. And now I'm ready to use a tool that we've already used, which is the bevel tool, to pull out geometry for the prongs. So I hit B for bevel, <coughs> and I can right or I can just click, and then I can hit T for move and pull it out like so. Okay, and because I'm gonna, I want it to curve and bend, so I need a little bit of geometry in here, just like I did with the handle. Now I'll um, hit B for bevel, and I'll click, and I'll hit T for move and pull it out a little bit more. And again, whether these are enough or too much, probably I'll probably have to extend the handle to make the proportions correct. I don't know. Um, this might be enough. We'll see. Um, I'm just going to put two. No, I need to put one more cut in here. So I'm forgetting what I did. Okay, let me undo that. Let me go ahead and hit B for bevel, click, and then hit T for move and stretch it one more time. So I do have, this will allow two bends in here to pull this down. Okay, so the proportions right now are a little bit, not more than a little bit, they're pretty wonky right now, but that's okay. Um, I'm more concerned that I get this correct and then I can always stretch and modify the handle um, as needed. Okay, <coughs> now what I wanna do <coughs> is I would like to taper these a little bit, okay? I've got the geometry added. Let me make sure that um, bevel is no longer selected. So now I can use the, the stretch tool and I'm gonna stretch from the middle of the selection so I can see what I'm doing here. Same, use the same mode from center of selection and hit H. <coughs> now I'm gonna pull like so. Okay, see how we can taper? So I'm making them taper at the end nice and tight, like so. Okay, um, I'm done with um, that. I'm going to deselect. And now I should probably, just for the heck of it, hit the tab key just to see how this is looking. It's more like a pitchfork, huh? <laughs> okay, you know, but you're getting the idea of what, what's happening here. And notice that it doesn't connect real well here. But we're going to fix that in a moment. <coughs> so now what I need to do is um, let me go ahead here from this is the left view. Let me switch to right view. And um, I'm going to switch to points and deselect. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and select these points so that I can hit T for move and move this down like so. Okay, about like so. Turn off the move. Go ahead and select these. And again, hit T for move. Trying to get a nice, smoother. kind of uh, curve that I want here, so it actually has the curve of the fork. Um, turn off move, deselect. <coughs> Let's hit the tab key again. <coughs> and again, it's looking a little bit, it's still looking like a pitch fork, but um, you get the idea. <coughs> and so now I'm ready to reconnect this to this and then maybe adjust proportions. And that will that's really pretty much it. Okay, but you saw how I use the bandsaw tool to add geometry so that it affects only part of it. I had to cut it and paste it. <coughs> um, by metaforming it, you will notice how it changes the geometry or the look of it of the geometry considerably. Um, and now I'm ready to select everything here. So I'm going to select these two polys here because I need a little bit more geometry to reconnect this, but I don't need this much geometry. I'm only going to have it slice a couple in, in a couple of ways. So I'll go back to polygons and I'm going to select these two guys because I want it to cut across this way. I'm going to again use bandsaw and I don't want seven. So I want to go back to um, actions. I'm just going to go back to reset and you'll see that um, I'm going to enable one divide right here. 
and I want it to be uniform. Um, I also, I'm going to go ahead and I'll leave it auto because it is going in the right direction. And what I want to do, I'm going to edit this. So I'm going to go ahead and add. So I want to go ahead and add one more cut. That's it. And let's go ahead and make sure that it's uniform. You see how it's added those cuts along here? <clears throat> and now what we can do is to is what we've done before with the foot to the leg in um, uh, with reboot and the other day when we attached the handle to the to the cup um, we used the weld tool and that's pretty much what we're going to do now I have um, I'm done with a bandsaw tool I can deselect it and now I can proceed and I can do this in wireframe might be easier because they should already be pretty much joined to one another. So what I want to do here, um, let me view it here in wireframe. It might be easier <coughs> to look at this in wireframe, I think so. And I need to zoom in just on the areas that I want to, the area that I want to focus on. Okay, select points. Make sure the points are selected, not polygons. Um, these select points. And now I'm going to select these two. And now I'll go ahead with um, detail. I'm going to go ahead and hit weld. Or make sure that only two points are selected. You know that they're welded together now. So I'll select these two. And again, select weld. Now what I want to do is I need to select this point. I'm going to move this one. Nope, never mind. I want to move this one to this one. So I'm going to select this one first, then this one. Because I don't want the prongs to change at all. I want the, the end of the handle to change. Does that make sense? Remember, when you weld, it depends on which points you select first as to which one is going to move to which. <coughs> I want these prongs to stay put. So I selected them second. So now when I select weld, two points selected, see how that one moved to here, not the other way around. Let me spin this around and let's do the same thing. Again, I want this prong to stay put, so I will select this one first and then this one so that this slides over, not this slides over to here. Select weld again. Boom, that moves. So I've got that attached. Um, I need to attach the top. So again, I select that one first. So it's the one that moves. Then this one, and I weld two points. And I'll go ahead and I'll select these two. And I select weld. Because these um, are sharing the same space, I don't need, I'm, I'm, selecting, I'm selecting two points at the same time. And so it, it's not a big deal. I guess I should. I could also select merge since they're both sharing the same space and welding the two together. And now let's um, spin this around. Let's zoom out. <coughs> and I should probably stretch this out just a tad, change the proportions a little bit. <coughs> so I can select all of these guys. I can hit T for move, so let's stretch this out so the proportions look a little bit better. And if I want, I could probably stretch this out a bit too, but I'm not going to at the moment. I'm curious to see what the proportions look like, so turn off move. <coughs> and again, we're viewing this in you know, just pretty strict looking polygons. I'm going to switch the texture. Um, it looks like it's been forged, but really roughly. And now when I hit the tab key, you can see that this joins together pretty nicely and that the prongs are nice and smooth and round, and that's how you build your fort. Now, you can come back, and we can tilt this so that this is a bit of an angle, because if you look at how forks are, you know, you have the prongs that come out, but in order for it to work, our handle should be tilted a little bit. So what I could do <coughs> is I could come back a little bit. <coughs> and again, with <coughs> points selected, I could select. Depends on where I want it to pivot from. I want it to pivot from here. 
So um, I'll go ahead and right click, make sure all of these guys are selected. And I don't want it to pivot from the center of the selection. I want it to pivot from my mouse. So I hit Y and I want it to click here. You see how I can have this actually dip a little bit at an angle. So it's starting to look a little bit more like you would think a fork to look a little bit the angle. I am probably adjusted it a bit too much, but for exaggeration, turn off Y, deselect. <coughs> <clears throat> now, if I want to rotate the whole thing, I can. Um, let me go ahead and hit this so we can see what I'm looking at here. Prongs are probably still a bit too long, but I could go ahead and I could stretch this from here, and I could weight it, or I could continue to stretch the handle. The handle might be a little bit easier. I could also widen it a little bit. Again, it depends on what kind of fork you want to make. Um, so this could be tweaked a little bit more, but you get the basic idea of, of how I built this. And um, <coughs> for the most part, it looks pretty decent. Might see a little glitch here. I'm not sure whether I do or not. <coughs> okay. Any questions about how I built this? But you can see how um, by using sub patches, by hitting the tab key, it really dramatically changes it. And you would need to um, use it for, you know, if nothing else, just to see it more like the, the shapes that you would see in the final piece rather than try to use Boolean functions and using the rounder tool to round off the side and things like that. Um, so even for some things that are, are forged or, or built mechanically, you're going to want to use an organic style of modeling and make it work. And this would be one way to do it, the same way with a cup. A cup makes more sense, though, because if you think about it, ceramics is organic. It is clay. And even though this isn't constructed of clay, we're building it and forging it as if we were pounding it with a hammer as opposed to using... <coughs> mechanical tools or something to cut it and to trim it, you know. Are there preferences for the, uh, for the tab keys? Like you can, sometimes you use the tab keys to overdrive. It does what it's going to do. Okay. It does what it's going to do. It either overdoes it or underdoes it, and that's where you have to, <coughs> early on, toggle back and forth and say, have I moved this enough? Have I exaggerated enough, or is it going overboard? If it's going overboard, remember early on when I just had the handle and I added a little bit of geometry to it by knifing it a couple of times, that it, it really lessened the amount of, of distortion or roundness to it. It's better to start with less and add than to, for example, start with a sphere and you know metaform it that doesn't make sense. Most of it is, because that has a lot of geometry to start with. Um, start with a cube. Um, and I, the term is box modeling, and box modeling now is used for a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things. So. Can you show the operation of the dance down here? <coughs> yeah. I don't quite understand how, how you might want to do it. Okay, let me um, go back <coughs> and let me um, fit all. And I'm just going to build a box. And it doesn't matter whether it's a box or what it is. It's going to cut one way or another. And it can cut right down the middle. And to ensure that it cuts right down the middle, it's a good tool to use. And when he was, th that's what I remember, when he was building the hand, and he started with a finger, and he wanted to add geometry down the middle so he could make the, the tip of the finger a little bit more rounded. He needed geometry along the middle, middle. So he used bandsaw, one cut, but it ensured that it was right down the middle. And he tested whether eve or even or odd, which way is it going to cut. Um, simil in a similar fashion, if you want to add geometry on either side and you want a couple of cuts, and so you select a polygon and you can divide that a couple, you know, two, three, multi multiple times. Um, anyway, let me go. Instead of picking the fork, 
Oh, okay. Um, well, I chose, I helped it choose the direction. And how I helped it choose the direction, and let's, uh, let me show you. You can do it automatically, or you can select an advance. So if, if, I want to, if I wanted it equidistant along here, what I could do is I could switch and select polygons and select these two. And it's going to divide equally this way. So now if I select under multiply, the bandsaw pro tool, see how it's cutting this way? So um, let's, let's undo that and let's deselect the polys and now let's go ahead and select again but I'm gonna select lengthwise, I select these two. So now it knows when I select the bandsaw pro tool that it wants me, to, that I want it to make the selection this way. And the tools in here, if we go back to actions, just reset, it doesn't do anything but if I say enable divide, it has one cut, and maybe that's all you need. And for the finger, that's what he wanted, so he could take these two points and pull it out, so that when it's metaformed, he got you know he hit the tab key, he got a much rounder tip at the end. But it has to cut all the way through, and that's why I said it was unusual. And I wouldn't have guessed this myself until I saw the exercise, you know, some a couple of years ago. To say, okay, you cut them apart. And then you, met, you subdivide as many as you need, which was like seven cuts for the prongs, and then only use a couple of cuts for the handle and then weld it back together, and then that's adequate. That turned out to be adequate enough geometry because you don't want all of that geometry in the handle. You just don't need it. I suppose you could. You know, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but I guess this is, and it seems, it seemed correct to me. I'm trying to pass along information to all of you that makes sense to me, and it made sense to me that that, that would be a smart way to work. How do you know that? Experience. And I think the more um, of the videos that you look at on NewTek's website, the more, um, you know, tutorials that you view, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. Here are some new tools. It, it's amazing what you can learn. And you can go to other people's websites too, just light wave modeling techniques or videos or tutorials or something. <coughs> and the more of that stuff you watch, the better off you are. And, and even going to, well, SIGGRAPH I think this year is gonna be in New Orleans. Or is it, is it gonna be in Florida? I don't know where it's gonna be this year. It's next year. It's not gonna be in LA, unfortunately. But to go, and I, I didn't go this year, but I went last year, and it was also in LA, <coughs> and I was at, or was it in Florida, no, not in Florida, um, San Diego, I think, <coughs> and it was cool. I sat for hours watching the guys model in, in, in Lightwave, you know, doing their demos, because I thought, okay, I did the grand tour to see what other people are doing, but because I use Lightwave more often than not, I want to see what these guys do that are doing this day and night. Some are better than others. <coughs> there was, or let's just say different. There was one guy who was an illustrator at, um, he worked for Disney for a long time, an animator. And he got interested in the 3D because he had to, you know, because most traditional animation has kind of gone away. <coughs> Even stuff like anime that you see is done 3D and you can, you know that in Lightwave that you can render stuff to look like it's not 3D, it looks 2D. Were you aware of that? You, you can do that, it looks pretty cool. <coughs> um, and so what you'll see with anime is that a lot, I won't say all of it, but a lot of it is done <coughs> in 3D and then it's when it's rendered and they use specific shaders to make it look like it's done in a flat 2D style, not 3D modeled. And it looks really cool. So you get these, these smooth transitions and movements <coughs> that's done a little bit, you know, you don't need tweeners anymore. You do need the designers to design the characters and you need, <coughs> you know, the people who set up the, the bones and all that sort of thing and um, the animators but it's, it's done differently. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Anyway, it was, he had to learn this, the, the 
he didn't say that, but he, you could tell he did. And there were some horses and stuff that he designed that were stylized, that were done almost in the style of Snow White or Sleeping Beauty or something. I'm trying to remember one of the, he went, the horses that were, you know, elongated. The proportions are different from a, from a, a real horse, but they're elegant. What can I say? Elongated legs and stuff. And so he was building it boxy this way and pulling out the legs and tapering them and tabbing back and forth. And you were, you were getting a really nice feel for it, building out, building the neck, you know, starting with the body, building the legs, adding minimal geometry as he went. <clears throat> and it looked really cool. He didn't get the wow. I mean, people didn't sit for a long time. I liked watching him because I enjoyed seeing what he had done. When he the people, the guy that got the wow <clears throat> was um, a guy who built heads. You know, he didn't build the bodies or anything. He could, could clearly. But just using box modeling, using the same text techniques that we are, he would build these interesting characters, you know, that you would see. Um, <clears throat> was it Go Golem? What's the character in um, Lord of the Rings? Gollum. Yeah, Gollum. Okay. Similar characters to him. I mean, just out of his imagination. But he had, I mean, he had done this for fif over 15 years using light waves. And you know that when you're working on a project, you're working minimum 12 hours a day, you know, at least five, six days a week. You know, so that's a lot of board time, and you get really good really fast when you're putting in that much time. So he understood the proportions, and he knew, okay, I built ears before, I built eyes before. I mean, it just was rote, but he could, felt really comfortable and changing proportions, and every time he built one, I watched him build like two or three of these things that didn't take long for him to build, not like the ones that the videos that we've seen. I mean, they were just amazing. You know, with minimal geometry, minimal tweaking, it's just like, wow. It, it's the same, I don't know how much you've watched people draw, people who really know how to draw. It, it is, it's magic when <coughs> they draw or paint and they use minimal strokes, and it's just so fluid, and it looks like they're just randomly making these strokes, and then suddenly, voila, here's this incredible drawing, and you know what's not? It's that they've done it a gazillion times, and they have incredible hand-eye coordination. They know exactly the proportions they need to use, but fundamentally the same techniques, and it's useful to watch them um, to see you know, I mean, you watch it again and again and again, and you learn just as you would. In the old days, if you were um, <coughs> going to be a painter, you started by mixing, you know, the artist's paints, or you're actually grinding up the, the pigments so that you can mix the paints and this and that, and gradually you would maybe transfer his cartoons onto the wall so that he could use, the pla you know, a plaster, um, what are they called? The, um, gesso? Je well, not gesso. It's um. Oh, it's when you paint on wet stucco. It's um. I'm drawing. This is. My, I'm having a middle age moment. Why am I doing this? Um. Sistine ceiling, Michelangelo, the, um, Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci, um. This is before canvas. Either painted on poplar wood if it was a portrait or they painted on um, fresco. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. It's painting on a wet pot. Anyway, you know, you worked your way up. And then later on, you know, when you got pretty decent, then you would paint the bodies or you would paint the trees or you would, you know, you start by painting the backgrounds and stuff. And the master painted the faces and the hands. You know, that's what they did. That's all they did. I mean, now it's even reduced, been reduced to less than that. Um, if you've ever watched a, some videos of, of some of them, like Murakami and stuff, they have huge studios. And they oversee it like an art director, but they very rarely touch any of it themselves anymore. You know, it's all done by a studio of underlings, you know. I guess people, when you look at the painting, you don't. You think Murakami, we still think in terms of 18th century as a master, you know, as the Enlightenment. 
you know, of this individual having a gift doing it, but it's changed. It's not that way. I'm going off on tangents. But <coughs> anyway, it, the point is the more of this stuff you watch, the more of it you learn, some of the videos and stuff, because <coughs> to sit and watch me hour after hour is kind of silly, because there is going to be one direction you want to go over another. If you want to build cars, that's a whole different mode of modeling. If you want to build characters, that's a different mode of modeling. There are different techniques. If you like products, that's another one. You know, I, I enjoy environments. I like creating the illusion of space in 3D, and I think it's wonderful how that can do that. And it really does it well, where you create this. I mean, it's hard when you, if you've ever done that with painting or drawing to create that illusion of three-dimensional space, air. <coughs> and you see how it's done in the computer. It's pretty cool. You know, I, I find that pretty amazing how they're able to create, capture that. So the more of that stuff I look at and, and, and observe, you know, it, it helps me with my own work. So this is just another, um, I'm going to probably, I'm going to transition next week um, into advanced surfacing. I need to cover UV maps and displacement maps, which are pretty cool. Um, but before I do, um, before I do the UV maps, I want to do displacement maps because there are displacement maps are like bump maps, but it actually moves points. Bump maps change the surface normal, so you really don't change the geometry at all. Displacement maps do change the geometry when you apply them. But you can create hills and valleys and all kinds of stuff, crinkly surfaces, flags that ripple over time and all kinds of stuff um, by applying displacement maps. And then if you want, you can animate them. Um, and then move on to UV maps. Um, UV maps can be used for all sorts of things. Um, I think for those of you interested in gaming, they will be especially important because it's a way of applying maps to surfaces in a very efficient way and minimizing the number of, of um, of surface maps that you need, you know, image maps. You can reduce it to one. Um, and it, it's just like this one big rubber suit that fits over the whole thing. And if you've played any number of games, you see how characters, you don't see it divided evenly. It's just a smooth texture over the whole body and different ways of doing that. There's also 2D programs that are available. And in fact, I'm t I was told by Chris the other day that um, CS4 in Photoshop has added more features to be able to bring in object files, meaning your 3D files, and paint directly on them, which would be pretty cool. So you can move them in space and paint on them like you are, like you can an actual object in the real world. And there are some nice programs that, that will do that. So it makes it easier because when you start mapping if you want to map a face onto like an egg shape, to get everything to fit in the right place isn't easy. And it takes a lot of time and effort. And by using some of these 2D programs, it makes it much easier. Um, okay. And if Photoshop can begin to do that, that would be pretty cool. So you could bring in a character that you've bottled and start to paint on it. You know, maybe break it down into some basic colors color maps and then paint on it and paint the face on it and you know paint detail and everything and send it back over to your 3D and render it. it could be pretty cool. So I haven't seen what it can do, but I know that there's some other programs that can do that very well. You can actually paint bump maps on it. You can paint transparent maps, all kinds of stuff. <coughs> so that as you know, if you want to create pores and things like that on on characters, you know, you can paint in areas and stubble, you know, Things like that. So, go ahead. Okay, so you answered like one, one of my questions. It just depends on the direction that you choose it as far as what goes inside. If I don't, exactly, but you know, if I don't select a direction, so let's don't select any polygons, um, turn off Bandsaw Pro. And now, since I have nothing selected, then everything is selected, right? So we're going to go back to multiply. In Bandstraw Pro, I need to select something. So if I select one polygon, I don't know what direction it's going to go. Okay. 
So now I can select Bandsaw Pro. See how it did that? Enable Divide Auto. So now if I select Odd, and if I select Even, so if you only have one polygon selected, then, then you just select even or odd. Do you, how do you tell which, which is even and which is odd? I don't have a clue. And I don't think the guy that demonstrated had a clue either. You know, it might mean something to the programmer, um, and they could better explain it, but it's easy enough to toggle back and forth. And, and, just, remember that, and just remember that cuts all the way through. So <coughs> that will determine. <coughs> Say what about the number of divisions? Yeah, the number, like, you know, if you want to add them, make sure it's uniform, and we can edit, and we can add, or we can delete. Okay. So every time, if I say add, every time I click, I can add, add these, oh, okay. and then I can select uniform, and you can see how it's added it uniformly when I'm done. It's just like using the knife tool, but my guess is, um, I mean, there is a a whole lot of difference, but there is. Um, it's a little bit, well, especially if you want it even, yes, and that's something you'll want. And that's one of the useful features of this, so you're, it, it will be mathematically even when you cut in between here. Okay? Okay. Okie doke. Anybody know how many more weeks until Thanksgiving? Three? And then we have two weeks after that before finals? Is that correct? So we fundamentally have five weeks left, right? Okay. That should be adequate time for everybody to, to build. I think we're on a pretty good schedule.